So we should give rise now to the uh, aspiration to attain enlightenment uh, as being the best possible means to uh, benefit others in a meaningful way, in an ultimate way. And in order to attain that state of awakening, then we now are studying and uh, reflecting on the uh, teachings of Shantideva. And uh, formulating the intention to put the teachings into practice. Okay. So we, uh, just to recap, uh, this text is divided into, or let's say this, uh, one, one way of, of approaching this text is by seeing that it is uh, uh, got three different uh, uh, sections. Uh, three chapters, first three chapters explain uh, how to give rise to bodhicitta. And the second three chapters, fourth, fifth, sixth chapters explain, teach how to not let bodhicitta that has arisen uh, decline. And the uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth chapters are how to bring bodhicitta to fruition, to uh, a culmination. And then the tenth chapter is a chapter of the dedication of the merit of the text. Uh, so now we are starting out with the, we're starting uh, to make our way through the fourth chapter, which is uh, carefulness here, or heed, heedfulness or carefulness. And It seems as though when we read this, that there has been, that, that Shantideva is, is uh, assuming uh, that we have uh, uh, given rise to this aspiration to attain enlightenment out of compassion for sentient beings and are intent on entering into the engaging bodhicitta. And since the, the uh, subsequent chapter to that uh, arousal of bodhicitta is carefulness, then there's a uh, something, there's a, uh, we should appreciate that even though we've given rise to bodhicitta, it's very vulnerable to uh, uh, being forgotten or uh, uh, disappearing basically or being corrupted and so then the chapter on carefulness is presented uh, and I uh, or we discussed the the idea of carefulness as being part of the bodhisattva discipline actually these next two chapters carefulness and introspection or are both uh, the uh, teachings on um, bodhisattva discipline. And Shantideva, as I mentioned last time, uh, is 
mostly talking or mostly uh, explaining how to actually practice the discipline. He's not giving all these uh, enumerations of, of the various uh, precepts and rules and so forth. Uh, so we are now at, uh, starting, we, I think last time I brought out the intention of chapter one or of uh, the first verse. And of course, I'm, I am just recollecting or uh, drawing from the commentary by Kunzum Pal, uh, Palzan, uh, uh, who wrote the commentary to this, one of the many commentaries, uh, particularly uh, he's presenting it according to the way that in the tradition of uh, Paltrow Rinpoche, And so the second verse uh, is the second and uh, second uh, several verses. Uh, maybe the second to the 11th verse are uh, teachings on uh, how to bring to mind what is to be accomplished. The fourth chapter, the second verse says, uh, whatever was begun without due heed and all that was not properly conceived, although a promise and a pledge were given, it is right to reconsider, shall I act or not? Uh, this verse, uh, refers to um, what, how we uh, ordinarily, how we should uh, think of things in a, in a kind of ordinary way. Uh, we do many things. I mean, the idea here is that we do many things without really thinking. And we say we'll do many things without really thinking of, any, of the consequences. Uh, and we haven't, as he says here, we haven't properly uh, con conceived the implications of what we might say that we'll do. This is just in a conventional sense. And he's basically saying that we should uh, re uh, consider or reconsider what it is that we uh, have uh, thought to do and if it doesn't fit with our, uh, with our correct reasoning, our understanding principally of, of causation and interdependence, then it's, it's perfectly uh, reasonable and acceptable to change your mind or to uh, 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 to, I shall act or not, to not do what you thought you would be doing or what you even said you do. Uh, basically, here, carefulness means not to just rush into something recklessly or be rash in uh, what you think you'll be able to do without really taking a good look at your capability. So it's appropriate to reconsider your promises and and uh, uh, reserve the right to uh, reconsider doing or not doing based on a possibly a more sober uh, 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 more sober thinking about what you thought you could do. Sometimes we we say we'll do something just to uh, make other people happy or to, well, somebody's got to do it, so I'll do it, or, or doing it uh, just out of, uh, you know, good intentions, but not really considering that it's not really, uh, you wouldn't be, you won't really be able to do it, or it's, it would 
it would be something that would really go against your, uh, say, newly found precepts, your newly found or your newly undertaken uh, principles of life. Now that you've taken the Bodhisattva vow, there's a, it's looking at your uh, actions with a, a new lens. And so there's nothing here. He's basically saying that there's nothing wrong or in, inappropriate about uh, changing your changing what you'll you say you'll do if it doesn't match this uh, greater uh, conduct of the bodhisattva uh, recklessness and being making a rash. Uh, decisions about what you'll do uh, may lead to your suffering and it may lead to the loss of your bodhicitta. You, you said you do something uh, without really considering the karma of it. So here, then in verse 3, is different. Here he's saying, yet what the Buddhas and their heirs have scrutinized in their great wisdom, I myself have probed and scrutinized. Why should I now procrastinate? So here the situation is quite uh, unique in that what we are undertaking, what we've decided or what we have said we would do is something that the Buddhas have seen to be the most meaningful thing we could be doing. And it's been uh, reinforced by uh, their heirs, meaning like, okay, Manchushri. Like we don't have to uh, go that far in our analysis. Uh, but, you know, like, like somebody said, you know, if, if Manchushri thinks it's okay, then I think it's okay. You know, I don't have to uh, too too much procrastination. Plus, I've already, for instance, uh, gone over and and uh, agreed with and have gotten excited about bodhicitta by my contemplating and reflecting on the first chapter. And in the first chapter, we come across things like. You know, for many eons, deeply pondering, the mighty sages saw its benefit, whereby unnumbered multitudes are brought with ease to supreme joy. Okay, that's for me, then, we think. And here, the, the 11th of the first chapter, since the boundless wisdom of the only guide of beings perfectly examine and perceive this priceless worth, those who wish to leave this state of wandering should hold well to this precious bodhicitta. So here uh, we shouldn't, uh, and uh, we should understand that the Buddhas and the Manjushri and the Avalokiteshvara and the other bodhisattvas, uh, their uh, analysis and what they came up with as the most meaningful thing uh, uh, that we could uh, most meaningful thing to uh, undertake was not based on confusion. It wasn't guesswork. It wasn't based on ego clinging. It was uh, a decision or it was a, a conclusion that was uh, drawn completely without a trace of delusion or self clinging. And then we also should have put uh, we also should have reflected on the immeasurable qualities of bodhicitta. And so why should I now procrastinate? I mean, we already had the oper we already have given rise to that aspiration, bodhicitta and engaging bodhicitta. So it's not something that's beyond my sphere. It's not outside, it's not beyond my reach. I conceived of it even. 
And so then all, the, all I need to do now then is to train in the precepts. So why, why, why procrastinate or why, uh, why draw back? And then the fourth verse says, for if I bind myself with promises but fail to carry out my words indeed, then every being will have been betrayed. What destiny must lie before me? So we've, we've already uh, accepted the responsibilities of uh, bodhicitta. And even here on the other page here, verse 34 of the previous chapter says, and so today within the sight of all protectors, I summon beings calling them to Buddhahood until that reach until that state is reached to every earthly joy, may gods and demigods and all the rest rejoice. So we are in the presence of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and uh, witnessed by them. And we're also uh, witnessing or have called all sentient beings, you know, so, uh, and said that, okay, we will, I am, undertaking the, the training of bodhicitta to free you all from samsara. Uh, and so uh, if I, if I uh, fail to carry out those words in, in deed, in other words, if I fail to, to uh, uh, if I reject or ignore or uh, avoid the precepts of the paramitas, basically, indeed means here this, the six paramitas, generosity and so forth. Uh, then it's not, uh, I'm, not the on, I'm, not, uh, I'm not the only one who will fail to attain liberation from suffering or enlightenment or even a higher, a higher state of being but I will be letting down all beings. So I, I've become a, a deceiver. I've betrayed uh, beings. And so what destiny is for that? Well, when you, uh, when you betray someone, then you're, you're, uh, the, the result of that uh, betrayal is, to, is something uh, unsatisfactory, more unsatisfactory, basically what we could call the, the lower realms. So it's crucial at this point then to decide that you've made this promise and in consideration of all of the above, it's a promise that you will fulfill. That's the, the sort of the conclusion at that point of the fourth verse. You, it's time to make a decision that you will fulfill it. And of course, the name of this, uh, the title of this uh, chapter is uh, Carefulness. So all of these contemplations and reflections that, that Shantideva is, is uh, writing of here are to instill uh, carefulness, heedfulness, because mm -hmm. we mentioned this, heedfulness, mindfulness, and awareness. That's what uh, all of these reflections in these two, cha two chapters are uh, for. Uh, so heedfulness has to do something with exercising control over, over uh, yourself in regards to here, sort of in a conventional sense of virtue and non-virtue. And uh, mindfulness is to remember uh, how to, to remember the, that. Like mindfulness uh, is like, uh, like a, a rope, a, a connector. So being mindful and being heedful and then being aware means to know what you're, behavior, what your speech, what your mind is doing. And so these verses here are, uh, are 
to instill that. Uh, I guess there's two ways of relating to these, uh, to, to this uh, bodhicharya avitara. Of, uh, one, like, well, uh, this is Shanti Deva's, as it says in the beginning, I'm just giving you, I'm just giving it out and I'm just doing it for my own benefit. If you happen to hear it, great. Then, then if, you, if you have the same sort of karma as I do, then you'll, you'll get some benefit out of it. But I don't have uh, any hopes or fears about it. So we can relate to it as, okay, this is the, uh, and of course he's, he's pretty much using the first person uh, throughout here. And so then when we read it, thinking that, oh, Shanti Deva is saying this, and we could emulate Shanti Deva. Well, if Shanti Deva feels this way, if Shanti Deva acts this way, if Shanti Deva thinks that way, then I, who emulate Shanti Deva, who want, I'll do it that way also. Since also we could just turn it in a, in a similar way, but just thinking that Shantideva is giving direct instructions. And when he says I, and we say I, we should think I. So that's just a sidebar. Also, uh, and these chapters, these, these mid chapters, uh, the, this uh, heedfulness and uh, introspection and uh, of course patience, but uh, they're very much uh, about our conventional experience. And of course, Shanti Deva's conventional experience is based on uh, what, seventh century India, based on Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings of uh, what, 500 BC. And here we are 2021. And so, uh, uh, even though these these the conventional uh, truth, this is the relative the relative truth, and the instructions here uh, seem to, by and large, fit. Even after twenty five now twenty six hundred years, the point we should always uh, we should remember that the whole point of this chapter, the previous chapters, and the subsequent three chapters on introspection and anger, meditative concentration and diligence. The whole point of that is to gain wisdom. It's almost like it would have been, you know, of course, this isn't the way that the, the, the commentary approached it. They just took it verse by verse, beginning to end. But, but uh, if we should remember, how do I say? Uh, how do I say? Let's see. What, how Shanti Deva, what does Shanti Deva say? And this is, we should uh, remember this verse from the ninth chapter. And he said, all these branches of the doctrine, the enlightened sage expounded for the sake of wisdom. Therefore, they must cultivate this wisdom who wish to have an end of suffering. Relative and ultimate. These, the two truths are declared to be. Okay, so two truths. The ultimate is not within the reach of intellect. 
for intellect is said to be the relative. Anyway, so here, uh, the whole, what he's saying is that the whole point of his exposition here is wisdom. So when we are kind of going through this, reflecting on it, and maybe sometimes it's gonna be challenging, you know, uh, from our, uh, our uh, uh, modern perspective. Uh, but we should realize that this is a relative, this is the a conventional approach on how to bring out wisdom. And there may be some people who all they need to hear is a very few words about the absolute nature of mind and they realize it. And that all this stuff then becomes irrelevant and discardable, Disc uh, it's, it's unnecessary. Uh, the Buddha taught uh, two, two kinds of teachings, uh, the expedient or provisional teachings and the definitive teachings. The definitive teachings are the teachings of wisdom, prajnaparamita, Buddha nature. Methods he taught are the expedient or provisional or the uh, well, like in the second chapter, like let's pretend that we're making all these offerings from the absolute wisdom point of view, there is no karma, there is no merit, there is no, nothing is, there is no duality of permanence or impermanence, no duality of virtue or non-virtue. All those teachings, all these teachings are expedient ways to arrive at wisdom. So I just mentioned that uh, to possibly relieve some of the struggle you may have in reflecting on it. And, and, and this doesn't make sense anymore. This doesn't make sense because there's a purpose and it is what are called provisional. It's true up to the point where you capture the stance of wisdom, then it's not true anymore then there's karma is just an illusion. Samsara doesn't exist, it's just an illusion. Liberation, the liberation from samsara is an illusory liberation. But we're not there yet. So we need the expedient truth and Buddha taught the expedient truth in order to lead beings who are still under the delusion of duality, self and other, subjective, objective, suffering, happiness. Okay. Uh, maybe some great uh, teacher if they were going to teach the Bodhicharya Avitara and had the, you know, had, had a command, a real master of this, they teach the ninth chapter first. To me, that would be, uh, I think for, that, that might make uh, good sense, that would be a, a, a good way to, to go. Because then we know what the point is. If we just get bogged down, one verse after another verse after another verse, like, and not really understanding where it's all going. 
that's why I interjected here. I'll probably maybe I'll interject it again. Okay, then of five. If in the teachings it is said, meaning in the sutras, it is said that those who in their thoughts intend to give a small and paltry thing, but then draw back, will take rebirth as hungry spirits. Okay, case in point. So here, uh, it is said, and there's a couple of quotes from sutras and many, many uh, citations we can find of uh, that, when you think to give even something like a, a head of lettuce or something very small, uh, and then you, because of uh, and our thoughts intend to give, and so, but then draw back, meaning that you, you're, this is a draw back, particularly meaning you, you feel stingy. Because of stinginess, you decide you're not gonna do it. Just even if you had the thought, this is something we should, uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, powerful practice to notice uh, how, how and how we are and how we are not willing to uh, give. Uh, but here, uh, and because uh, when uh, being stingy and drawing back, it's, it's, uh, in, in the, it's called, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thing, it's, it's, a, it's uh, how do I say? It means it's a dryness. That's why they say in the, the Preta realm, one of the uh, consequences of that kind of, like here it says, you know, you, you want to either you give hold back, you take rebirth as a as a Preta, meaning the Pretas are in a very barren, dry place. Matter of fact, it's so dry that when they put weight on their legs or little itty bitty legs, sparks fly from the joints is so dry and causing tremendous pain. And that's from stinginess. And then, uh, so our mental intentions, you know, when we, we think, when we intend to give and then verbal promises, like those two just here, he just mentions thoughts, but also if we then verbally make a promise and the, of that, uh, there's a much more powerful karma involved with much more, uh, much more powerful and much more extreme consequences. So that's again here, this is, we shouldn't be, uh, uh, make hasty promises. It says of bodhisattvas, don't make many promises. It, it, I mean, uh, I don't know where it says that, but I've heard that, oh, uh, bodhisattvas are not people who make lots of promises because they know that the circumstances change and the causes and conditions and interdependence are unpredictable. The one promise is that until samsara is empty, I will act to benefit sentient beings until they're all brought to the state of enlightenment. That's the promise. So, and the six, how can I expect a happy destiny? See, these are all reflections on how we need to uh, fortify ourselves to live up to what we promised. How can I expect a happy destiny if from my heart, I summon wandering beings to the highest bliss, but then deceive and fail them? So as, as we recited in the previous chapter there uh, with the uh, uh, bodhicitta vow, uh, we basically we from our heart, you know, we we uh, made a commitment to infinite sentient beings uh, uh, to bring them to the bliss of enlightenment. Uh, but if uh, so, how can we expect even temporary happiness if we deceive them? and fail them in that regard. 
And we also not only fail, fail sentient beings and have deceived sentient beings, but we also have deceived the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who have uh, been a witness to our vow. And the results of deceiving and uh, failing to uh, uh, honor one's commitment of such a uh, heavy uh, responsibility is to uh, to be deceived. You know that karma. The, the, even if you're in a, even if you uh, have a a, a good uh, a rebirth, then you you the karma of that will you will be deceived, and you will uh, people will fail to to you will fail, or people will fail to uh, do what they say in regards to you. Uh, that's again, that's just in a relative sense. Uh, so here, the the message or the reflection we should we should reflect on this as uh, as in a way to strengthen our commitment to train ourselves in bodhicitta uh, and not and be careful that bodhicitta doesn't get discarded or sidelined. Day seven says, as for those who losing bodhicitta lead others nonetheless to liberation. Karmic law is inconceivable and only understood by the omniscient. Uh, so here then, uh, Shantideva inserts uh, some, uh, some, what would you say, a caveat or like, well, how come uh, there is this, uh, there are instances of people who have uh, given up bodhicitta but then went on to attain enlightenment. And of course, one of the most uh, uh, in, our, in our, our time period, uh, one of the disciples of, of Buddha Shakyamuni was Shariputra. And Shariputra, uh, many ages ago, many lifetimes previous to his uh, his lifetime of his life of uh, serving Shakyamuni Buddha, but he made the, the vow, the, took the bodhicitta vow, and uh, practiced bodhicitta and uh, cultivated that vow for many lifetimes under many uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then, at one time, he he was, I believe, a king. A king and one malicious demon uh, wanted to harm uh, him and he appeared to the king as a uh, Brahmin and uh, asked or, uh, the king for his, to give him his uh, right hand. And of course, the bodhisattvas, we train in, you know, giving uh, the three foundations of self-clinging, body, possessions, and virtue. And so uh, Shariputra, as that king, during his lifetime as that king, had brought his bodhicitta and compassion to such a point where he was able to uh, cut off his right hand and present it to the uh, uh, um, bad-minded uh, being, this demon who, was a, who took on the guise of a Brahmin and tried to present it to him and he used his left hand and if you know Brahmanical culture, that's like the highest insult or the most uh, flagrant, uh, what do you call it, Con source of contamination is to use your left hand to give something to someone, of, especially to a Brahmin. And the Brahmin was so uh, uh, insulted, he acted, you know, he was so insulted and outraged and wouldn't accept 
his hand. And at that point, the king, who, who later became Shariputra, became so dejected and felt that, that you know, generosity protect, perfecting the paramitas is so hopeless that he, 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 he gave up his bodhisattva vow and decided to take the path of just attaining arhat ship or arhat hood, uh, which he did. Uh, and then, uh, of course, later then, uh, attain enlightenment under uh, Shakyamuni. So, and led many others to liberation. Uh, and uh, this actually in the commentary, uh, there's some discussion about, about this as far as uh, whether or not Shantideva here is pointing out uh, that uh, he's pointing out basically how karma is inconceivable. Karma, he says karma is inconceivable and only Buddhas understand karma. We can't understand karma from our uh, percept, through our perception, like we can understand uh, phenomena through perception. I, I can say oh, my perception indicates this is a cup and it's serving the purpose of a cup. So it's a valid means of knowing something is through direct perception. Or you can use like subtle phenomena, uh, inference. Like I think there's hot water in here. I can infer that without touching it or looking at it because for various reasons, it always has hot water in it or something, but I can't perceive the hot water, but I, I can say that I know that there's hot water in there by inference. Inference is like where there's smoke, or, uh, where there's uh, smoke, there's fire, yeah. We can infer that there's a fire somewhere if we see smoke. And then there's the more, the third is a more subtle, super subtle, very subtle, and that's karma. Karma is like that. We can't, or our ordinary uh, intellect can't grasp, can't comprehend the intricacies of karma. Inconceivable. Uh, and that's really the domain of those who have pure view, pure vision. Pure vision meaning uh, untainted perception, untainted by uh, delusion, Buddhas. Those Buddha, Buddhas can uh, uh, understand the intricacies of karma. And so the fact that someone has lost bodhicitta and still attains enlightenment is through some kind of assemblage of causes and conditions. Likely all the previous good of virtue and bodhicitta training that this individual who became Shariputra had accumulated in the past offset this uh, relinquishing or, or giving up his bodhicitta vow. Because and now that you know when you take the, the the bodhicitta vow, the worst violation or the worst breakage of that vow is to give it up, to abandon sentient beings, or decide to give up uh, the Mahayana uh, enlightenment. And just and uh, become a someone who is a Shravaka or Pratyaka Buddha, 
that just I just want to. This is all too too challenging. I'm not capable of liberating all sentient beings. I just want the peace of this short this nirvana of the arhat. I just want to become liberated from samsara. I want all my kleshas to just completely dry up and disappear. So I no longer experience samsara. That is the uh, one of the uh, main ways, main uh, uh, breaking of of uh, samaya or of the bodhicitta vow. Uh, they don't actually call samaya on the bodhi. Sattva is called a, a vow. Samaya means a vajrayana. Uh, so uh, this this uh, particular uh, verse here uh, is, is about that, but it does point to the uh, weight of renouncing bodhicitta for the sake of accepting the uh, lesser of what's from the maha path, Mahayana view, accepting the lesser path to simply attain the peace of nirvana. Uh, uh, so then there's uh, eight, the eighth verse here is this failure this failure for the bodhisattva is the gravest of all downfalls. Okay, there, he said it. For should it ever come to pass, the good of every being is thrown down. So it's not that you are only, uh, uh, harm, uh, like say, you are only uh, When you give up bodhicitta, you are letting all sentient beings down. Uh, attaining just the peace of the arhat, of the nirvana, uh, you, are, you will be unable to benefit beings. You will be unable to benefit infinite beings who fill space. Uh, arhat, uh, what is it? Arhat, uh, when you attain arhat hood, arhat ship, when you become an arhat, when you have completely relinquished or completely uh, uh, become f liberated from the cause of karma that leads to samsara. That is to say, your kleshas, uh, this self, uh, you've realized non-self, a certain level of non-self, uh, then there's, that's what's called uh, nirvana with remainders. In other words, you're still, you still have a corporeal form but you have attained nirvana, arhat. Then uh, when the lifespan of that corporeal form uh, ends and the arhat dies, then there's what's called the nirvana uh, without remainders. And it's very limited. So there's just that limitedness to it. And that mind is, uh, that mind uh, no longer takes a rebirth, but abides in some fashion. The consciousness is not completely, has not completely reached enlightenment uh, because there's still some lack of realization 
insofar as the self nature of phenomena. There is the realization of the non-self of the individual, like from one's, uh, but there's not, like in the Mahayana, there is, there is, we, we are striving to accomplish or realize the non-self of the individual and the non-self of phenomena is what's called the two non-selves or the twofold non-selves. And the arhat, the sahinyana approach, the goal is only realized as the non-self of the individual. And so their enlightenment, and in this case here with the bodhicitta, uh, absence of bodhicitta, then there is uh, an inability to benefit infinite sentient beings as there is with the uh, Mahayana uh, approach that leads to what's called complete unsurpassable awakening. Uh, so this uh, this downfall, the gravest of downfalls, means that the bodhisattva discipline of either uh, rejecting or uh, not uh, refusing when you can to help sentient beings, refusing to give when you can, refusing to help when you can, uh, Sentient, uh, one sentient being and uh, giving up or uh, taking up this attitude of self-liberation. Uh, okay, then in the, the ninth verse says, and anyone who for a single instant halts the merit of a bodhisattva wanders endlessly in evil states because the welfare of all beings is reduced. Uh, so, uh, okay, so then uh, this has to do with uh, creating obstacle. If you create obstacles, or a bodhisattva, it could be a beginner bodhisattva or whatever. Uh, for instance, this, this demon who created the uh, Shariputra having given up bodhisattva vow, like that kind of action, or of course that's a, uh, that, that's a little extraordinary. Exotic, uh, but um, but just uh, even if you halt here, it says for a single instant, and this single instant is significant because every moment beings are born in the lower realms of suffering. Every instant, there's someone born in a hell realm. Every instant, someone's born in a tormented spirit realm. Every instant, someone's born in an animal and a human. Um, like the, so a bodhisattva is, is uh, his, the bodhisattva, his or her trajectory is, is un, un, at every moment is, is directed towards awakening. And at awakening, and as you approach awakening, your ability to liberate beings, to draw beings, uh, to you, through your virtue, through your previous aspirations, and set them on the path. Like when you interrupt that, even just one instant, you are affecting multitudes, numberless beings. And so any action that impedes the causes of enlightenment is heavy. The, out, the, the, the results of that action is heavy. You don't want to halt the merit of a bodhisattva.
again, because uh, from bodhisattvas, their uh, sphere of influence or their, their uh, uh, bodhisattva is immersed in all, in the, in all sentient, in infinite sentient beings. And then in verse 10, it says, destroy a single being's joy. That is to say somebody in the higher realms, a human or some, someone in a, a heavenly realm. If you, if you uh, uh, just harm their joy, if you, if you steal their joy, you yourself will uh, wind up in the lower realms and you will work the ruin of yourself. So then no need to speak of bringing low the joy of beings infinite of space itself. So you're, you're stealing or you're obstructing the virtue of a bodhisattva, uh, which uh, uh, interrupts the joy of beings and their eventual enlightenment. Like if you uh, distract uh, the pilot of a jumbo jet, you know, with so many hundreds of people in it, you distract the captain, uh, or if you, you know, strangle them and kill the captain, you, the karma is, you have the karma of killing all the people on the plane. And all those people on the plane, they had uh, relationships, they had family. And those families, they had offspring and so on and so forth. And it goes down in, you know, generations. It's like one instant here, it talks about if anyone who for a single instant halts the merit of a bodhisattva wanders endlessly in evil states because the welfare of all beings is reduced. Just one instant, like how long does it take to pull a trigger? You know, less an, that's an instant. And you kill someone with that instant act of one instant, you kill someone, as we know, I mean, we're living in it now, where that person dies, but that person also has family and relationships and business or whatever. And for generations, that, that hatred that's been aroused and that, that pain of losing someone from one instant, uh, is the responsibility uh, karmically accrues uh, to the the person for one instant of an act? I knew when I used to work in a prison, and the, you know, people who gang, you know, young gang gangbangers who were involved in this time, you know, in the uh, time when there were a lot of, you know, drive-bys and just random things and, and the, the, the regret and the pain that they felt. I know one guy, you know, seven, eight years in prison, just one, one thing, not even, uh, with much thought, you know? now the, the suffering of that, they feel more and more every year, the, 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 the hopelessness of their life now, that's just them. Then the, the other the people that were affected, you know? Uh, so uh, this, we should uh, reflect on that as far as uh, from the, the greater scope of the bodhisattva and what the bodhisattva is intending to do once they accumulate the 
results of aspirations and engaging bodhicitta and the merit that they're able to uh, uh, accrue that will and give them capability. You know, merit equals capacity. Mm -hmm. Destroy us. Okay, we did that one. And then 11, and those who circle in samsara mixing powerful downfalls with the power of bodhicitta back and forth will long be hindered from the bodhisattva grounds. Uh, so then you may ask, uh, or we, you may think, well, uh, I say that the bodhisattva vow is like a, a gold uh, pot a gold container and like the pratimoksha vows the vows of individual liberation are like uh, uh, like porcelain you drop porcelain it breaks and all the king's horses all the king's men can't put it back together again very difficult if you if you're a, a nun or a monk and you kill a human being then you you cannot uh, you cannot retake that vow for this lifetime that's the, the you've broken that vow uh, a bodhisattva vow they say it's like a like you drop gold and it and it dent it gets dented and you can uh, work it you can bring it back through purification and confession the four powers and so forth as we must know by now uh, so uh, uh, here is referring to that. If we abandon bodhicitta or if we break our vows, so it might not include abandoning bodhicitta, but if we are heedless, remember the context here is this is all meant to instill in us an appreciation of how we need to be careful. Mm -hmm. It's not setting the, these are, this is not the absolute truth that we need to strap ourselves into like some uh, 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 armor or not like armor, what am I saying? Like a straight jacket, straight jacket. Yeah, I don't know if we have straight jackets anymore, but it, uh, it's, it's, it's to reflect on in order to, uh, 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 put our bodhicitta commitment into a context that, that we have power. We have the power to train our mind to, by being careful. And so this idea of, of uh, damaging our, our bodhicitta vow and being careless, well, we can always purify it through the four powers, which we can do. But we may avoid lower realms by purification, but if we continue to just be careless and then purify and be careless and then purify like this, uh, it will create possibly in our alaya, you know, this, uh, this uh, ground of uh, the storehouse of our karmic seeds somewhere in our consciousness, uh, the, the qualities of the bodhisattva ground or the bodhisattva levels, the, our bodhisattva qualities, our bodhicitta qualities will be blocked. We'll always keep going around in circles like that. And the real qualities, the flourishing of bodhicitta will not happen just like when you put, I don't know, like you want to maybe put like cardboard over your garden so that weeds don't come up. So something like that, it, it creates a blockage, this purifying and then breaking and purifying and breaking. So you may not go to the lower realms, but you will not accrue or you're not you won't uh, you won't feel the arising of these 
amazing qualities of the bodhisattva path. And so then Shantideva, and then uh, we can identify with that, uh, says, and so according to my promise, I will act attentively from this day forth. If I now fail to strive, I'll fall from low to even lower states. So now he is arousing his, he's making a declaration. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the situation that I need to look out for from you know, one to 11, say. And now he's saying, okay, so uh, I have to respect my training. I need to respect my, uh, uh, have respect for my bodhicitta training and to act attentively, to, to pay attention to it, not ignore it either, and uh, pay attention to it with devotion and carefulness and with joy and with happiness. And as he says, from this day forth, if now I fail to strive in that way with, with carefulness, with mindfulness and with introspection, I will probably experience the lower realms one after the other. First, a, a, an unsatisfactory human birth at best, then animals, then all the karma of animals leading to the lower realms, each lower realm, the, the actions of each realm leading to lower and lower realms. Lower means more suffering. It's not like lower, like a, like a, a class system or a caste system or a you know, first class, second class, third class. It's not like that. It's all about suffering. Higher states are called higher because there's less suffering and lower states are called lower because there's more suffering. And so now I, I will uh, strive with uh, carefulness, carefulness in the, in the trainings and avoiding what the faults of the training are and mindfulness to keep the points of practice in mind, mindfulness remembering and introspection to always be observant of my uh, body, speech and mind. Uh, then the 13, uh, this 12, 13, 14 are, are his sort of conclusions. It's, it's uh, like anytime we do any kind of contemplation, whether it's uh, uh, the Four Noble Truths or the Impermanence or uh, the Infallibility of Causes and Effects or the Shortcomings of Samsara or Precious Human Birth, any of these contemplations uh, we should contemplate, but also we should uh, always draw conclusions at the end or at some point. Therefore, what? Going forward, I will such and such. You know, we should always do that, like have an action item. Otherwise, it's just, it's the good thoughts, the productive thoughts, but uh, the action item, the conclusions you draw will give you diligence. So if you contemplate discipline, as we've been doing, and we just leave it at rules and discipline and how it's so terrible to, to break any of these rules. Uh, again, we'll just be stuck in like a prison with gold bars. And maybe good food, but it's a prison. So we need to 
um, decide what we're going to do based on our understanding of what the discipline is and uh, guard, be diligent in guarding our precepts, striving for the benefit of all that lives. Unnumbered Buddhas have already lived and passed away. But I, by virtue of my sins, have failed to come within the compass of their healing works. And this will always be my lot if I continue to behave like this, and I will suffer pains and bondage, wounds and lacerations in the lower realms. So these uh, uh, also are sort of Shanti Deva's sort of. He's very tough guy. He's a very tough person, Shanti Deva. You know, he's very tough on himself, and it gets worse later on. You know how he. He really uh, has, has no uh, no hesitation at uh, at condemning him, himself. But so uh, basically, he's saying here that uh, Buddhas uh, uh, can't. You know, Buddhas have come and gone. Many Buddhas have come and gone. According to this uh, this Mahayana concept of time and space, allows us to conceive of of infinite Buddhas having come and gone, teaching, some not teaching, some teaching, uh, some uh, bodhisattvas taking bodhisattva vows with Buddhas here and there and so forth, infinite, infinite situations of, of uh, uh, present and presentation of the path to enlightenment. Uh, but now, uh, uh, and those Buddhas, I mean, we're still here, and the Buddha himself, our, our Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, said that uh, uh, I can't uh, pull you out of, I can't, uh, what does he say? I can't make you enlightened. You know, you have to do yourself. I'm just showing you the way. It's, it's through your own diligence uh, that you will attain Buddhahood, that you will become a Buddha. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, but I, you know because of uh, uh, my lack of merit uh, I haven't really been I haven't attained Buddhahood yet it's not Buddha's fault maybe even we were all uh, uh, disciples of Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, but, you know, we were just maybe just as stubborn then as we are now, uh, just as uh, indulgent and distracted as, as we are now. Uh, so uh, in order to come, in order to actually be here to come within the compass of the healing works, uh, in order to be deeply affected by the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings, we need merit again. And even the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, his cousin, Devadatta, uh, he's a family member. They were children together. And they were, they had a relationship for Devadatta's and for their whole life. And still Devadatta never saw the Buddha as anything but a con artist and a charlatan. And gathered disciples around him himself, Devadatta, and made up his own rules and tried to uh, interfere with the Buddha and tried to, you know, rolling rocks down on him when he's passing and all these sort of very malicious actions to harm the Buddha. And uh, he never saw the Buddha's quality. He never uh, what is it, uh, came within the compass of his healing works, his, his words. Even when 
the earth opened up and Devadatta saw that he was going to be catapulted down into the uh, flames of hell, uh, the Buddha uh, couldn't pull him up. All he did was, he was able to do was to uh, give him uh, uh, or have him take the vows of refuge and the three jewels. And at that time, when he did, uh, he called out, save me. Uh, and then Buddha also at that time predicted his, uh, when he would become an arhat. Understanding that kind of karma is, uh, that's the mm, domain of the Buddhas. And so then this will always be my lot, you know, to be separated from Dharma if we act negatively and continue to, to do no, like new, new uh, virtue. And I will suffer pains and bondage, wounds and lacerations in the lower realms, even in the higher realms, says. Even, in the, if, even if we have the fortune to uh, take birth in the human realm, we'll suffer the consequences of, uh, of our negative actions if, uh, if we don't take, if we don't uh, take the training in bodhicitta to heart. Uh, there's always, like we can't always control our circumstances In fact, we rarely can control our circumstances, but are we always, there's, I'll not say we, like say, there is always a choice to be made. There is no predestination. We don't believe in karma is not predestination. Choices are thoughts, thoughts. Every thought is a choice. Accept, reject. And as countless as our thoughts are, those are our Choices are countless. So once we set our minds on this bodhicitta and train ourselves in uh, heedfulness, then, then we'll be on the path. Uh, See, so that is kind of the end of one.